chapter 32, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. I've read for you Psalms chapter 32, verses 1 through 2. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Pastor Tessa.
Thank you for loving me. Thank you. Thank you for so Thank much you, grace. Lord, for all you've done for me. If it's peace, it's at the table. Come on. Come on in, where the table is spread, and the peace of the Lord is going on. Come on in, where the table is spread, and the peace of the Lord is going on. Hey, ha! 
Praise the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and grace and peace to everybody here in Jesus' name. Also, grace and peace to those who are on the phone line and on the internet as well. Grace and peace to all in Jesus' name. Give the choir another round of applause. <laughs> Children's choir and the choir do a wonderful job. And we know we're celebrating what the sixth day of the Feast of, of Tabernacles today, and it's also the Lord's um, weekly Sabbath. So we're not here just because we all decide to get together and have some food and play some games. But we are here because the Spirit of the Lord guide us to be here. The Spirit of the Lord guide us to cook the food. The Spirit of the Lord guide us to have a holy convocation. And when we talk about his spirit, we know we're talking about his holy law. Because um, fortunately, the subject we're talking about today is the most hated subject in the world of uh, modern Christianity. If you talk to anybody about the law of God, they look at you strange. They look like something's wrong with you, like they want to apologize to you, like they want to put their head on your head and see if you got a fever or something, like you're just sick. When actually, the very thing that they, you know, dismiss is what the Lord requires of us to keep us on the straight and narrow. Because in order to serve the Lord, we have, must have some kind of rules and regulations to do it. Right. It's not like, um, and you know what, and that's the problem. That's why you got so many different denominations, because everybody got some rules or regulations that they choose to follow, but it's all under the banner of Christianity. If we was all Christians, you would think we were all doing the exact same thing. But unfortunately, it's not like that. It's not like that at all. Why? Because the very guideline of somebody to be Christ-like is the very thing that they dismiss that you don't have to do anymore. Right. Because as soon as they read the title of this lesson, the first thing that come out their mouth is, well, you're not on that old law. You can't be telling people you need to keep the law. You can't keep that old law. It's impossible to keep that old law. That's why we got Jesus. And they make it seem like that Jesus wasn't around in the beginning. So in this lesson, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the law, obedience, the penalties, and also the reward. But before we get into les today's lesson, let's go ahead and start off in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Because this is what we need to have a, uh, a good understanding of when we talk about the law. Because when you talk to the average person or the average Christian, you know, they say they believe in the Bible. Well, actually, the only books they believe in is what? Acts, Romans, and Galatians. Anything outside of that, they really don't deal with. They call themselves a New Testament Christian, but you can read some clear scripture with Jesus, who is the one we're going to stand before, and they'll dismiss that and run to Paul. It's like you got to ask them, are you a servant of Christ or are you a servant of Paul? Because before I talk to somebody, the first thing I tell them, if we're going to discuss this book, we need to understand this to make sure we on one accord. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Right. Jesus is the one we understand before. Jesus is God. Jesus is the words that we need to abide by just so we understand that. Jesus' words even trumps Paul's words just so we all on one accord. Because you can read some stuff that's clear as day out the mouth of Jesus, but then you go to Paul's um, uh, Paul's writings, and it might be kind of shaky. Because they rather lean on what Paul is saying, and just for the record, Paul's not saying anything wrong. And that's why in this lesson, we're going to actually break down the foundation so we can understand what Paul is talking about a lot better. Because some of the words we read today, we read them before. But hopefully, we'll get a better understanding of how to talk to other people, how to go out there and spread God's word. Understand when we read Paul's writings, we don't have to get nervous. So when you talk to somebody and they run up in Romans, you don't have to get nervous. Why? Because you understand the foundation and what everything is built upon, and that's the law. That's right. Or if you want to use it, what they call, um, some people call this called the Torah. 
So that's what we're going to deal with today. First Peter chapter three. And we're going to start at verse 15. This is what we need to understand about the writings of Paul. Brother, when you get there, go ahead. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh of you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. All right. So off the bat, Peter saying, but sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts. Set your mind apart from everybody else. Set your mind apart from the worldly doctrines for the worldly things being taught out there. And it says, be ready. How? Always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope in, with meekness and fear. So if you're going to talk to somebody, be ready, to, be ready to deal with them and also have a meek and humble mind. You're not going to battle. You're not going to prove how much you know. You're not out there trying to just go tip and tat debate with somebody. What are you trying to do? You are trying to convert somebody. And how do you convert them? By the law of God. It's the law that converts. You're just dealing the word of God. Too many times I ain't seen brothers who want to spread the word end up getting debate. And it gets a real heated argument. I mean, we're supposed to represent the most high God in, in a humble and meek spirit. Because the Bible says the tongue is breaking the bone. A soft tongue break a bone. And remember, that's your ultimate goal, just to spread the word. Sometimes you might have just plant the seed and leave it alone. That person might not see what you're talking about, but they heard it. And the Lord going to send somebody else to water it. And then they'll be like, man, I heard this before. But they're going to build upon what you already put there. Just remember, we're keeping a humble and meek mind. And it says, always be ready to give an answer. 16. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of, e as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So they already think we're crazy. Tell somebody you're Hebrew Israelite. Man, they didn't Google Hebrew Israelite. Unfortunately, our militant brothers and sisters make us look bad. We don't want to confirm that. That's why he said, look, meek and humble spirit in the fear of God. Because you're just trying to educate them. And if they reject it, they reject it. Right. Ain't no skin off your butt. You're just doing what you're supposed to do. And then once they see how you handle it, once they see how you stand calm, once you stand how you just sticking with the book, then when they speak evil of you, the people around you are like, that brother, don't, he don't even cuss. I never see him get mad. I think you, I think you might have got it wrong. Because that's what Peter's saying, right? He said, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, because first of all, you're talking about the law, and their mind that's evil. As evildoers, they may be ashamed, falsely accused you by your good conversation in Christ. Why? Because you're dealing with them in a humble and meek spirit. Verse 17. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. All right, so it said that if it's well, God, that you suffer for well-doing and evil-doing. Flip over to 2 Peter. I'm going to add this in there real quick, too. 2 Peter chapter 3. And this is actually what I was getting to, but that scripture was a good intro. 2 Peter chapter 3, and start at verse 15. And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation... Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, had written on, unto you. Now, what's the whole thing that Paul was talking about? Salvation. That's what this whole thing is about. From Genesis to Revelation, the ultimate goal is about one thing, and that is salvation. Are you going to get into the kingdom or not? That's what this thing is all about. All the way from Genesis, all the way to Revelation. And that's what Paul preached about, salvation. Verse 16. As also in all his epistles, speaking of them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Now you see what Peter said? Peter read some of Paul's writings. And Peter knows that Paul isn't saying anything wrong. He might just scratch his head a little bit, but he knows that Paul is talking about salvation. But he's saying that the people who read some of Paul's writings, they'll take them, they'll rest, or they'll twist them until they what? Own destruction. destruction. You'll read some point blank out the scripture, like swine is unclean. 
But then you will show it to a quote-unquote New Testament Christian or a follower of Paul, and they'll show you some things in Paul's writings that may be hard to understand that sound like it's contradicting what Almighty God is saying. Because they are unlearned. Because they don't know the foundation. And they'll twist them unto their own destruction. That's why we have to be better than that. We have to be ready to give an answer in meekness, humbleness, and fear of the Lord. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we get so excited and full of adrenaline and we forget what we're actually supposed to be doing. And that's representing the Most High God in a humble and meek spirit. So even Paul, I mean, Peter is telling people, look, some of Paul's writings are hard to be understood. And people who don't have the wisdom that they, that, of, of God, they would take these writings and they would twist them unto their own destruction. So we're going to take a look at some of Paul's writings, and we're going to look at the law in general. Once again, the title of today's lesson is called The Law, Obedience, Penalties, and Rewards. So we're going to start from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because as soon as you start talking about the law, the first thing people say is, we don't have to worry about the old law, we have Jesus. Or we're under the law of Christ. Well, let's establish something real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to start at verse 1. So when we start talking to people, we go out there and start spreading God's word. When it comes up and God gives us the opportunity to represent him, we should know how to handle it. We should know how to start off. Because first thing they're going to say, like I said, is we're under the law of Christ now. We have Jesus now. We don't have to worry about that law of Moses. But let's show them how it was Jesus who gave us this law. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to start at verse 1. Brother, when you get there, go ahead. Moreover, brethren, I would, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Uh-huh. And did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. Now, Paul is talking to the Corinthians, right? This is a Gentile church, meaning a non-Israel. They didn't know nothing about the law like Israel had it. Israel had the law since birth. Israel had the law since the Lord established them in the wilderness, which we're going to look into. So they didn't know anything about this. So when Paul is talking to him, he said, look, don't be ignorant of the fact how the church was baptized unto Moses. And they all did eat the same spiritual meat. What do you mean by the same spiritual meat? Obviously, it was the same thing that Paul was delivering unto the Gentiles, isn't it? That's why I said they're eating the same spiritual meat and the same spiritual drink, the very thing that you're eating of, the very thing that you're drinking of, which he's talking about the word of God. The church ate of the same thing as well. But the question is, who gave it to them? Verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So Christ didn't just start a New Testament, did he? He said they drank of that same spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So Christ's been around since day one. So if you want to talk about the law of Christ, then you need to go to the Old Testament and read about the law of Christ. If you want to talk about how G we have Jesus now, you need to go back to the Old Testament because the Old Testament has Jesus as well. It's nothing new under the sun. When he says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he means that yesterday, what we call the Old Testament, Jesus was back then. And then they say, well, you know, the church started in the New Testament. Go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Because we already established that Christ been around from day one, that Christ been around with Moses, that how was Christ who was, came down on Mount Sinai and spake with the children of Israel. Let's see when the church began. Acts chapter 7 and verse 38. <coughs> when you get there, go ahead. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. This is he that was in where? The church in the wilderness. So where the church start? In, in the, the wilderness. wilderness. That's where the church of God actually started. In the wilderness. The church of God didn't start in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Right. It was established way before then. Christ didn't start with Mary. He was around way before then. So it said it was he in the church in the wilderness. Go ahead. With an angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Now he said our father received what? 
the, the lively, lively oracle. oracle. Mm -hmm. The lively oracle. The same spiritual meat and same spiritual drink that Paul gave unto the Corinthians. The same spiritual meat, the same spiritual drink that Christ gave them. We need to know when people say you have to keep that law, who are they disrespecting? Who are they telling you not to listen to? They don't realize that. Because even when you get those people who come knock on your door and they, 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 they talk about how we need to uh, honor Father Jehovah. And then you ask them about the Sabbath day. And they say, well, you don't have to keep that old Sabbath day. Ask them point blank. Are you telling me I don't have to listen to Almighty Jehovah? Is that what you're telling me? Because they don't realize what you're saying. By saying, I don't have to keep these old laws, basically you're saying, I don't have to listen to Christ. I don't have to listen to God. Too many times they get up there and just repeat what their spiritual leaders are feeding them. Mm -hmm. We need to realize what we're saying when we quickly dismiss something that God had written down. So it said, our fathers received the lively oracles. And when did he receive the lively oracles? The church that was in the wilderness. So right now we found out that it was Christ who gave them the spiritual meat and spiritual drink. Mm -hmm. We found out the church started in the wilderness. So let's go back to the beginning and see where it all started. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Because the Bible is not set up for you to just hop in the New Testament and think you got a religion. It's not set up that way. Because if that was the case, you can do whatever you want to do. And that's the problem with Christianity. It's too many things under the banner of Christianity and everybody doing stuff different. If you just look at that, that don't make any sense. Even when you look at Islam, real Islam, I ain't talking about them jakes in Chicago. When you look at real Islam, they pretty much straight across the board, all of them. Even when you look at, um, you know, Hinduism, they straight across the board, but get to Christianity. Everybody hopping around, doing whatever they want. If you want Jesus to be an angel, go down to the kingdom hall. If you want to believe in a rapture, head over there to the Baptist. If you want multiple wives, they go to Mormons right over there. But they're all under the banner of what? Christianity. But they're so different. That should question somebody's mind right there. But let's take a look at the church. What God called the church that was in the wilderness, let's go back to the foundation when it all started. So about time we come up to Paul's writings, maybe we'll get a better understanding of what Paul was talking about. Because like Peter said, people who are unlearned, can twist Paul's writings unto their own destruction. Even Jesus said, the blind lead the blind, and guess where they're going to fall out into? Yeah, Everybody yeah. going to know what? The ditch, right? right? And what is the ditch? The lake of fire. Just like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, Lord, have I not prophesied in thy name, cast out devils in thy name, done many wonderful works in thy name? And what would Jesus say? I never knew you. Depart from me. But guess what? They were all in the banner of what? Christianity. Because they had taken Paul's writings and twisted them to their own destruction. So let's start off in Exodus chapter 12 when the Lord started dealing with the church. Exodus chapter 12, we're going to start at verse 29. When you get there, go ahead. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Uh -huh. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose. You know what? For God to dismiss this people according to traditional t teaching, that's a lot to do for somebody you just going to dismiss a couple of thousand years later, don't it? I mean, he took this mightiest nation that ever lived and killed their firstborn, meaning it was somebody dead in every house. And if you think about it, it could have been two people dead in one house. The father, he was the firstborn, and also his son, if it was the firstborn. That's horrible. Can you imagine waking up and you seeing your, your, the two people you love just dead? And who is doing this? Christ. This is Jesus. Because we read that it was Christ who gave them spiritual meat and spiritual drink. This is Christ coming for his church. Verse 30. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. 
for there was not a house where there was not one day. Uh -huh. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up, get you both, get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go and serve the Lord as ye have said. All right, so what was the Lord bringing the children of Israel in the wilderness to do? Serve him, right? Right. You think they're going to go out there and just start making stuff up? No. Nah. He's going through all this trouble. He's not going through all this trouble to put them in the wilderness and just leave them alone and let them come up with their own stuff. Right. That don't even make any sense. If you go through all this trouble for something, you, that means you have plans for whatever you're doing. You got a plan. You got it all mapped out already. I'm going to go, I'm going to study hard, I'm going to get this big degree so I can work in the field that I want to work in. You had plans. You struggled, you did whatever you had to do, you had plans. Now, look at Jesus, because I'm going to call him Jesus, even though he was called Jehovah here, but I'm going to call him Jesus, because we're going to keep this thing real. Because sometimes you got to put the name to make it all stick. So every time we read the Lord in the Bible, we know it was Jesus talking. So when we get to the New Testament, we're going to get all messed up. Because people like to play between, no, that was Jehovah, that was Jesus, now we in the Jesus, that was Jehovah, that was the Father, now we got the Son. It was all Jesus. So when you say you don't have to keep that old law, all you did you saying is you, you don't have to listen to Jesus no more. Why don't they just stop lying and say what they want to say? Don't listen to Jesus, just listen to me. <laughs> don't give your money to Jesus, give your money to me. That's bottom line, that's what it is. So Jesus went through all this trouble and killed the firstborn. Show you what kind of God Jesus really is. That he said it was not one in a house dead. And then Pharaoh said, get up out of here and go and serve your God. Jump down to verse 37 and let's see what happened. Go ahead. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. Now, let's show you how the Lord was with, with our people. We go through some messed up stuff, even through history, even in this country. We go through some messed up stuff. Israel went into Egypt with only 70 people. Only 70 people. And only 400 years later, how many come out of the land of Egypt? 600,000. Like the comedian said, we don't die, what do we do? We don't die, we multiply. That's what we do. Even in this class, the storefront was like, what, 50 people? We didn't double that just with kids alone. <laughs> but I show you how the Lord is looking out for our people. Even all the atrocities we went through in this country, you think we would be annihilated. But no, we keep getting bigger and stronger. Even after the Lord came out of the land of Egypt, even when they was feeding our babies to the crocodiles in the Nile, we still came up with 600,000, and that's just men. Right. Not including children and women. Mm -hmm. But remember, who is this we're speaking about? We're speaking about his church, right? Mm -hmm. He just killed a lot of people for his church. And if you think about it, that's the guy that got y'all back. Sometimes when we go through that hard stuff, remember what God you serve. Remember what God who killed all those firstborn for your forefathers and you. That way, when we go through our hard stuff, just remember that and keep the faith. If he can do all that, if he can call these locusts and do all that stuff just for our forefathers, what are he going to do for us if we keep the faith? So he said, and the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sikloth and 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. Verse 38. And a mixed multitude went up also with them and flocks and herds and very much cattle. So it said a mixed multitude. What do that mean? It was other people besides the children of Israel who were there. So when he brought his church out, when he brought his church out of the land of Israel, Egypt into the wilderness, it wasn't just Israelites. It was all the sons of Adam. Or it was more than just Israelites. This is God's church. So for our brothers and sisters who think it's all about just the Israelites and everybody else going to die, you don't understand the book. You are unlearned. And you're going to twist the scripture unto your own destruction. Because when we read about God's church, the one he went through all this trouble for, it said a mixed multitude, meaning it was people from different nations. 
Jump down to verse 49. Now, look what he said here. Since we're talking about his church and we know it's a mixed multitude with the children of Israel, what did he say? Go ahead. What law shall be to him that is home born and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you? Now, if the average person understood this, they wouldn't be so t- twisted when they talk to these Sunday worshipers out here. He said it's one law to him that is home born, to the Israelite, and also to the stranger that's a, that's a journey among you. One law. So according to that verse right there, and we read the foundational purpose, so we get a better understanding. According to when the Lord first started his church, he is telling you that it's only going to be one law, one way to serve him. You're not going to have a Sabbath for the Jews and a Sabbath for the Christians. How many is that? It's two, right? That's not going to happen. Even in the New Testament, he says it's what? One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. If you die and believe that you're going to go up to heaven, that's your faith. That's not one, is it? Because you got some people who believe something else. You got some people who believe something else. But it's all under the banner of Christianity. But if it was really to be Christ-like, everybody would be doing the exact same thing across the board. And what is that? His law. So he said, it's one, it shall be one law unto him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that should join among you. Because he knew his church would have multiple people. Let's go to Exodus 19. So now, he went to Egypt, he did many wonderful works, brought his church into the wilderness. Now, when he got to the wilderness, let's see what he did. Exodus 19, we'll start at verse 16. Exodus 19 and verse 16. Up until this point, the only person really was interceding with the children of Israel and between God was Moses. The church, the church really haven't seen God like this yet. They've seen all the miracles that God has done. They've seen how the Lord humbled the Egyptians, but they never spoke to God. This is when God going to show himself to prove who he is. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 16, when you get there, go ahead. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Now you see how God introduced himself? Our God is no punk. He don't have to sneak and do anything. He don't have to be quiet with it like he don't quietly rapture you all. For what? When he appeared unto his church, it was trumpets. It was thundering. He got the whole world attention. And if you Google it, Mount Sinai is still black unto this day. So he got everybody's attention. He's about to address the nation. Verse 17. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, mm-hmm. and they stood at the nether part of the mount. Now, this is a big deal. If the church started on in Acts chapter 2, how come we not seeing all this? How come we not seeing all the, the, the trumpets being blown? How come we not seeing the whole earth on, um, shaking? How come we didn't hear the voice of God? Because when God chose his church, he going to stick with it. So he said, and the people brought forth, and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. What happened? Verse 18. And Mount Sinai was all together on smoke because of the Lord descended upon it in fire. Uh-huh. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of, the, of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And this is when the Lord was coming down to meet his church face to face. And this, was, this is a big deal. This is not something we can take lightly. We always talk about black history, but this is the best history we ever had as a people. Right. <laughs> There's nothing greater than this. This is so much better than a peanut. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the God of the entire universe is meeting with his church face to face. And he's talking with them. Let's find out what he said. Let's go to Exodus 24. Exodus 24, and we're going to start at verse 3. Exodus 24 and verse 3, when you get there, go ahead. And Moses came 
and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with a one voice and said, all the words which the Lord hath said will we do. Now the people, when they seen God, they terrified. They ran for the hills. They tell Moses, okay, Moses, we believe you. You deal with him. You deal with him. We don't want to talk to him. He scare us, which that's the beginning of wisdom. So Moses like, fine, I'll be the intercessor. I'll stand in between you and the Lord. So the Lord talked with Moses. So Moses came down. He said, look, all the words unto the people. And what did the people say? We will do. This is the Lord marrying his bride. Verse 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill the, and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh -huh. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which, burnt with, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of, the, of oxen unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Right. So when they offered up an offering to the Lord, it was a lot of animals being killed. And we're going to really learn about that today. Because sometimes I think we dismiss a lot of things because we don't see this. When they offered these bullocks, the temple was a slaughterhouse. You have this big ox because of your transgression that you take into this temple and the Levites are slitting throats. This may get kind of graphic, but we need to really understand what this scene is about. And it wasn't just one. It wasn't just one. If you read the book of the law, how, in, in one instance, I think Solomon offered what? 5,000 bullocks? Y'all know what a bullock is, right? That's not a small animal. Right. These Levites, this is what they was doing all day long. And it's going to tell us the point of this. Because right now, we take transgression so lightly. Hmm. Oh, it ain't no big deal. Can you imagine every time you transgress so you wouldn't die, you would take this huge animal up to the temple and stand in line and just see this? Some of the animal activists out there, you'd be like, wow, I, I can't keep doing this to these innocent animals. But sometimes since we don't see this, I think we really dismiss it. We'll lightly say, oh, you don't have to worry about that. Oh, we all messed up. Let you start killing all your food. You won't be so quick to, um, to transgress then. So once they said, we will do, because that's what the covenant was. And they said, and the Lord is saying, look, are you agreeing to this? Are you agreeing to be my holy nation, to be my priest unto the rest of the world? And, and all you got to do is just keep this. All you got to do is be obedient to the things I'm going to tell you. That's all you got to do, and I will take care of you. You would have to worry about nothing. I'm going to give you the best land on the entire planet. That's what I would do for you. And what the people say? I do. And to confirm the covenant, because anytime you confirm the covenant, it got to be some blood. To confirm the covenant, they offered these bullocks. And what did he do? What verse you at, brother? Verse 8. Go ahead. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it upon the, on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. All right. So he said, there go the blood of the covenant. Now the covenant is sealed because they sealed it with blood. Something died for this covenant. You skip verse 7? Okay, go ahead. Read verse 7. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the, in the audience of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has said, will we do and be obedient? Now he said, all the way of saying it, it's a choice, isn't it? God is a free will God. God didn't make Israel do this. Israel could have easily said, no, nah, Lord, we're not going to deal with that. Just like us. We can easily say, Lord, I I'm not going to deal with this. Even like my little brother. I brought my little brother to class with me. And he told me straight up, he said, I know it's true, but I can't commit to this right now. I can respect that. I truly can. And all that I can say, oh, well, Lord willing, eventually, you know, you'll come around. But at least he was honest with me. At least he, and, and another thing, at least he's not going to Sunday churches and playing church either. 
Because you got some people say, I can't deal with that, but I can deal with that over there. <laughs> I can't call on that Jesus, but I can call that Jesus over there. There's a difference. But the children of Israel is like, look, everything the Lord said we will do, we will be what? Obedient. So then Moses went ahead and did the sacrifice and shed the blood of the covenant. You finish that? Let's go to um, Deuteronomy chapter 4. So now the Lord is telling us, now remember, who is this? This is Jesus, right? This is that same spiritual meat and same spiritual drink that the church was given to in the wilderness by Jesus. Now he said, all you got to do is be obedient. And what did Pharaoh say? Go out and go serve your God. Get out of here. Get away from me. I don't want to see y'all right now. So now it behooves us to find out what we got to do. Deuteronomy chapter 4, and we're going to start at verse 1. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 1, when you get there, go ahead. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them, that ye may live, and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. All right, so it's a stipulation. He said, therefore, listen, O Israel. Granted, he talked to Israel, but remember, they came out in a mixed multitude. And remember, he said, it's one law for them that is homeborn and them to the stranger. So he said, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and judgments which I teach you for to do them, that ye may live and go on and possess the land which the Lord God your fathers has given you. Verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye, may keep the stat, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. All right, now keep in mind, I'm going to point this out real quick. Notice he said that you may keep the what? Commandments, right? Because mm -hmm. you get them people, you hand them up to, to, in a corner. You know the first thing they start doing? They start separating the law and the commandments. Well, you don't have to keep that all law. You got to keep the commandments. But in, we, in this chapter, we're going to read that they're one and the same. Ain't no difference. I don't care if there was 10 tablets in the inside of the uh, covenant ark, but then there's other laws outside the ark. It don't matter. It all came out of the mouth of Jesus. And they're all important. So off the bat, he's saying, look, don't take away from this or don't add to it. So obviously it means like Jesus, because that's who we're talking to, because it's the same spiritual meaning, same spiritual drink, want everything to stay exactly how he said it, right? Verse 3. I mean, jump down to verse 5 and go ahead. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Uh -huh. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the other nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. All right, now it says do them, for what is our wisdom? The law, right? That's our wisdom. What is our understanding? The wisdom, the, uh, the law. That the other nations shall say, surely, this is a great nation and a wise and understanding people. We don't keep the law right now, do we? Nope. What do they say about us now? They crazy. Completely opposite. Look at us wagging their head like, I can't believe these people. Why, why are they so stupid? <laughs> Show you when you're going against the opposite of the word of God. The very thing that he gave us. And if you really think about it, everything that, that was guiding us was coming from Jesus. He was telling you what was best, how to live righteous. How, it was like you about to take a test, and Jesus gave you all the answers. Hmm. And you're going to say, I don't need that. I'm going to take this test myself. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, we're going to put a tree in the house. And then we're going to take some eggs and have them in the field. <laughs> Under the, under the banner of Christianity. Does that sound like wisdom to you? Mm -mm. But that's what we do. And then what else are they going to say about us? Verse 7. For what nation is there so great who, ha who has God so nigh to them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? 
And nobody what? else, nobody else is just connected to the Lord like we are. I mean, we praise him all day long, don't we? You can't see a movie when they talk about serving God without us being in the choir. Because hmm. we, 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 we were dedicated for it. That's what the Lord sanctified us for to do. But we're not doing it according to his wisdom, according to his righteousness. We're doing it how we feel. And we serve a God of knowledge. Knowledge comes first and then you feel. If you feel first, who knows what your evil heart is telling you to do. So he said, for what nation is there so great who have God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God in all things that we call upon him for? Verse 8. And what nation is there so great that have statues and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? So you mean the law and the commandments are one and the same? So you mean that it says in verse 8, and what nation there are so great that have statues and judgments and so righteous as all this what? Law. The Lord is talking about it. Moses is talking about the law is a great thing, now, aren't they? Mm -hmm. A great thing. To the point that it'll make us wiser than all the other nations on this planet. That the other nations will envy us because we have this great law. Law so righteous that the Lord said before us. And what are we supposed to do? Verse 9. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. It says diligently. Meaning, this is what's going to guide your soul is your body. This is what's going to guide you. This is what's going to tell you what is right and what is wrong. If you had to do these things.